So tonight we have, and tomorrow morning, we have a special teacher with us, Pastor Jeff Sowall from Calvary Madison is going to be teaching tonight and tomorrow morning. And uh, Jeff has been out in Madison for many years, and uh, he is uh, without fear of contradiction or I'm not being insincere, he's one of my favorite uh, teachers. So uh, we're just blessed to have Jeff. Jeff, come on up here, okay? We turn the lights on, Jeff? Let's just call it a night. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Wow, yes. Well, the, the wages of sin is Madison, Wisconsin. I don't know if you <laughs> saw that in your Bible. But yeah, that is. Uh, I've been there 22 years, and uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, Rush Limbaugh called Madison, Wisconsin, Moscow West. So it gives you an idea of what you're dealing with. But, you know, there's no gray area. It's like, do what side do you want? <laughs> you know, there's, there's no in-between, man. And it's, that is a real blessing about it. Um, I don't know if you heard in the news the, the fire bombing. You know, most news reports uh, called it a, a fire broke out at the uh, Family Action committee their pro-life place in Madison. They got a Molotov cocktail thrown in their window. You know, of course, the news, they're still trying to determine whether it's a terrorist act, you know. Yeah, well, I could tell you that. I don't know how much money a detective gets, but, uh, you know, <laughs> it was a terrorist act, man. And, it, you know, I know the lady, she's a great lady. She's been there for years. We've, you know, worked with them in prayer times and stuff. And uh, it's really sad the things that are going on in this world. But uh, awesome worship, and um, I'm going to be in Philippians chapter 2 tonight, so it goes right along with what we've been singing. Uh, Peter writes in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 12, he says, I, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. As long as I am in this tent, it is right that I stir it up to your remembrance. You know, it's a blessing to be here. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to come back. And Phil's one of my favorite teachers. You know, we give each other 20 bucks for saying that. <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, each time. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, it, it is a real privilege because I know that you guys are well taught. Um, I do, I've been doing prison ministry for 14 years and, you know, you go in and you try to develop a teaching for a group of guys, you have a hundred guys and most of them probably never went to high school, made it through high school, so it's a real challenge. But at the same time, you know, this one prison I go to, There'll be 80 guys there, just, it's a transitional institution and where guys go as they are being uh, prepared to do their sentence, 20 years, whatever it is, life, whatever, you know, going to whatever type of uh, institution they're sentenced to, but they're waiting, so it's always a different group of guys. But you go there and, you know, 80 to 100 guys maybe 20 years old. These guys are just entering into the system, you know? And of course, most of they're real tough, you know, I'm gonna take this on, dude, but, you know, we got five or six guys who've been through there who said, man, you are at your most vulnerable spot there because, you know, I screwed up royal, dude. I am, I messed up my life. And you can act as tough as you want, but, it's such a great ministry because you go in and they are vulnerable. They're open to the gospel. And it's just the challenge is like bringing this through. So it's, it's a blessing, guys, to be able to, to teach and be here tonight. Father, I pray you open your word to our understanding. Show us wondrous things out of your word. It's beautiful, Lord. Your scriptures are our food, Lord, our daily food. 
And we ask you, Lord, to feed us tonight, God, from your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Philippians 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, as we were just singing, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, if you're new to the Bible, if somebody's new to the Bible, if you are discipling somebody who is new to the Bible, this passage in Philippians chapter 2 is a very important passage of Scripture here in the New Testament in that it condenses down the essential doctrines of our Christian faith into just a few verses. Yeah, the incarnation and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, his preexistence, his equality with the Father, and thus the trinity or the triunity of God. It speaks of the Lord's sacrificial atonement on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension back to heaven as well as what is known as his exaltation back to his position in glory at the right hand of the Father. All key fundamental doctrines of Christianity. What makes this passage unique and what is, why it's so important is here in the New Testament is that all of these statements, all of these doctrines regarding Jesus Christ are presented here uniquely in a non-controversial way. Unlike how you'll find all these same core doctrines of our faith being defended throughout the rest of the New Testament, Paul is not making a case for these things. It's going to be very helpful when you're discipling new believers something. Paul's not making a case against an attack on these being true or to correct some false teaching that's been threatening to undermine the truth of core doctrines which is what you see in most of the other books in the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the book of Jude, Peter's epistles, Paul's letters of Galatians, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Colossians, book of Hebrew, John's gospel, all written at least in part to correct or defend the truth of all these same statements being made here. This letter and this passage in particular was just written to fellow believers friends of the Apostle Paul who all placed their faith in, they were living their lives upon these essential truths of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Paul's not disputing the truth. He's not trying to defend who Jesus is to skeptics. Most early Christians just accepted all these things. You know, this wasn't it wasn't for this particular path. You think dude, the apostles and the early believers were just constantly trying to prove, you know, these things that they believed because nobody believed it. Because nobody else, you know, would found the claims of Jesus Christ believable. If all you had were these other epistles trying to defend and, and make a case for, believe it or not, there were thousands of healthy churches by the end of the first century who didn't need corrective epistles. And just base their faith in what, we're, what you see right here, the holding the found, sound doctrines. Philippians was one of those. Now through the centuries, many of these statements of truth have come under attack. But here they're just presented as a reminder to fellow believers of what our proper way of thinking needs to be. And you think of how you know, a letter like this, people would just be sitting there, oh yeah, I get that, Paul, I understand. <laughs> like I said, you go into a lot of settings today, and I'm sure you know the same thing. You can go in, and people are like, what are you talking about, man? <laughs> you got to bring this down and try and explain it, but this is just, hey, don't forget this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, to say that this is the mind that was in Christ Jesus, is saying that 
what is described here is his way of thinking. And for him to make himself of no reputation, verse 7 says, to humble himself so others can be elevated, that's just how God's mind works. God doesn't change his mind. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever, Hebrews 13, 8. This has always been the way of thinking. It's just that's normally not the first attribute that people think of when they think of Almighty God. His humility, as an attribute of God, for Jesus to make himself of no reputation so as to humble himself comes natural to him. That's just natural for God. That's how he thinks. It's his nature for me to think that way, which verse 5 says I'm to do, for, for me to think like that will require going against my nature. That's why, you know, his epistle is written. It's what, against what's natural to me. My nature is just the opposite. My nature is pride. That's what comes natural to me. That's what I got to kill every day. It's the nature of all fallen beings. Pride transformed Lucifer to Satan. It's what changed angels to demons. And that same temptation to exalt myself to some false estimation of who I think I am or who I think I should be or want to be, that same temptation is what brought the curse of sin and separation from God to human beings in the first place. In the day you eat of that, Satan told the woman, if you just eat that forbidden fruit, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be like, Ooh, she's probably looking and going, wow. <laughs> I'm going to be grand. I'm going to be great and powerful. And she ain't well surprised. That's not how God thinks. He doesn't look and go, wow, that's going to make me greater. He's the greatest. <laughs> you know? <laughs> hey, that's not how God is, as was exhibited in the person of Jesus Christ when he was here on this earth. And if I'm going to follow him, if I'm going to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, that has to be my way of thinking as well, Paul is telling the Philippians. That's the point of this passage. Let this mind, he's reminding them, just remember who Jesus is, what he's done. Let this, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God. Literally, in Greek, it says, who was existing in the form of God. So right away, the doctrine of Christ's pre-existence is introduced, his eternal existence prior to entering this world of time and space as Jesus of Nazareth, with the nature of his eternal existence being divine. There's no clearer declaration of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ than this, because again, it's not an argument. This isn't a making a defense. This is just, yeah, they'd all be nodding, going, yeah, no one's standing up. Jesus never claimed to be God. What are you talking about, Paul? You know, that's John 1.1, 1, 1, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, elsewhere. You know, and nobody's arguing the truth of that here. That's what makes this passage so, you know, important. Paul just stating accepted fact and believers, yeah, dude, that's who Jesus is. Nobody reading this would be, you know, he, he never said that. The Greek word morphe, translated form in English, means he was in his very nature, his eternal essence, God. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, where form speaks of his nature, equality with God. Here, the, his not considering robbery to be equal with God, that speaks of his divine prerogative. It would not be a ripoff or a robbery for Christ Jesus to make full use of all divine attributes that God possesses. It's not a robbery. Omnipresence, omnipotence, all-powerful, omniscience, all-knowing, immutability, never change. Multitudes of other divine attributes are all at the Lord's disposal to use, none of which are used for selfish advantage. That's the amazing thing. He uses all of his power to make himself nothing. 
even though he existed eternally as God and all attributes of eternal God are his to use as he determines he used his divine power, verse 7 says, to make himself of no reputation. It took divine power for him to come to make uh, this transition. You know, if you were to go around and you just randomly interview people and you ask them, if you were almighty God and you had unlimited power to create the whole universe, what would you use that power for? And they'd be like Eve, their eyes would get really big. <laughs> Most people give an answer that probably something along the lines of somehow exalting themselves or they would say something magnanimous. Well, I would use my power to you know, make end all the suffering and end all the war. Oh, and there'd be no more violence. So in other words, you'd use all that power to boss everyone around and tell them what to do. You'd make yourself the boss of everybody. It says here that God, having that power, used it to make himself less than everybody. This is, of course, is speaking of what is called the incarnation, which according to this took place in three steps, basically, for lack of better term. First, he used his divine power to make himself nothing, literally, is what that means in verse 7, of no reputation. That means he purposely made himself a nobody. I remember reading the Queen of England, she came to the United States once. She brought 4,000 pounds of luggage. Yeah, I really, <laughs> my wife and I have been on some trips she brought her own personal doctor. She brought a refrigerator carrying 40 pounds of plasma. She brought her own personal leather toilet seat covers, a hairdresser, three valets, several other attendants. Her one visit to the United States cost about $20 million. When God came to earth, he arrived in a barn to a single mom so as to live in abject poverty this whole time. The second phrase where it says he took the forms of a bond, sir, made himself of no reputation, made himself a nobody, taking the form of a bond servant. There's nothing in the language that Paul uses here that in any way diminishes the Lord's deity. He's very careful in his choice of words to preserve that reality that Jesus remained fully God when he came to this earth. Upon making himself of no significance, he then took the form of a bondservant. Same Greek word morphe, used in verse 6, that speaks of his exact or fundamental nature of something. It's used here when Jesus was born into this world as an unknown, poverty-stricken Galilean. That was not a disguise. He took the exact nature. It wasn't just some outward appearance. It's what he was through and through, we would say. He took the exact nature of what would be the lowest person in that society in that day. He wasn't just faking it. He took that. He became a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, verse 7. In the likeness of humanity, literally. That's a phrase specifically chosen so as to preserve the Lord's deity without diminishing his humanity. Jesus Christ was fully human, but not in the sense that you or I or anyone else is human, just due to the fact that he was sinless. That's why Paul doesn't use the same Greek word morphe to describe the Lord's humanity. If he were to say that Christ Jesus came in the form, the exact nature of humanity, that would be improper because that would include corruption. That is our nature. The exact nature of humanity is fallen. It's why we need a savior. David in Psalm 51.5, he wrote, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin my mother conceived me. That could not be said of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul, of course, he's not implying that Jesus was any less human. He's not diminishing the reality of the Lord's humanity. But rather, Christ was the perfect human. The very thing required to make our salvation possible. 
He took our corruption upon him, per his perfect self on the cross, exchanged our corruption for his perfection. Made He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.20 We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, because he was fully human. But he was in all points tempted, even as we, but without sin. If I am a follower of Jesus Christ, I too am to be willing, willingly making myself insignificant and becoming a servant of others. I'm to let that be my way of thinking as well. How our salvation was achieved is shown in verse 8, where it speaks of the Lord's extreme example of sacrifice for others. The third step, so to speak, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. The world's version of the perfect man is celebrated on the cover of Time magazine, the man of the year, or on People magazine, or GQ, you know, the, the guy in the latest blockbuster movie, or the famous sports hero, but the only truly perfect man was there on the cross. There was nothing unusual or unordinary found in appearance as a man, nothing uh, unordinary in any way that the Lord was seen when he was here on earth. He wasn't Superman. There was no form or comeliness, no beauty that we should desire him, Isaiah 53. In other words, he wasn't even good to look at. <laughs> he didn't stand out from the crowd. All the language up to verse 8 is, is expressing the lowering of his nature that took place willingly as God. From exalted divine being in, in heaven, worshipped by angels, glorified with the Father, from that to someone who appeared here on earth as just any other ordinary guy. He was ordinary, and it says in verse 8 that as just any ordinary guy, he humbled himself, showing that it can be done. It's supposed to be done. So if I'm his follower, this is what I'm to follow. He became just a normal, you know, ordinary guy and at that point humbled himself. This is where the personal application of this passage enters in. If I'm seeking to honor, if I'm seeking honor, if I'm seeking credit, pushing for my rights, then I'm definitely not following the one is being described here who first willingly made himself nothing, then as nothing humbled himself even more. If they had this bicycle race in India every year where the object of the race is to go the shortest distance possible within a specific time, everybody lines up, there's hundreds of guys on bicycles, then the starting gun goes off, and everybody stays in their position. They're balancing on their bike. They gotta be on their bike. You can't let your feet touch the ground. But each rider inching forward just enough to keep their bike balanced. And then after like 20 minutes of that, another gun goes off and the race is over and the person who went the furthest loses. <laughs> you know, and the one behind everyone else wins. Yeah. It's actually a much harder race than trying to go as fast, as far as you can and leave everybody in the dust. That's easier than trying to hold yourself back so that everybody else can get ahead of you. But that is a spiritual example set by our Lord Jesus. He humbled himself to a place lower than the lowest human being not by putting on some fake humility or dressing a certain way, pretending to be something he wasn't, but by becoming obedient, verse 8 says. He became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, obedience unto death was a choice that Jesus made because 
in being the only truly sinless human being to ever live, the perfect man, death for Jesus of Nazareth was not inevitable as it is for everybody else. The wages of sin is not Madison. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. I deserve death. I earned it. Jesus didn't. He didn't do anything wrong, but he chose to die in my place, and he tells me as his follower, Jeff, you die to yourself for others. If you want to follow me, take up your cross as well. This is where I'm heading. That's usually where most people bow out. That's usually where the circle gets really small. <laughs> Where'd everybody go? You know, I mean, completely die to myself? You gotta be kidding me. You know, I got soccer practice, I got this game night, I got this thing. <laughs> I can't put myself last. I got too much going on, obedience unto death. You know, that is, that speaks of Christ here. His, his sacrificial atonement on the cross, his willingness to sacrifice himself on behalf of others. Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, he who is hung on a tree is accursed by God. Jesus took God's curse upon himself on my behalf and in response, verse nine, speaking of God the Father, says, therefore God also has highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is showing the ultimate example of what Jesus taught as a fundamental, this is a fundamental spiritual principle of his kingdom, the kingdom of God. Whoever lowers himself will be exalted whoever if you want to be the greatest you got to become the least he he exampled that to the infinite degree because of christ's infinite condescension he has been just as infinitely exalted highly exalted it says in verse nine and given a name above every name you can think of any other great name of every other person throughout history, not one of them became great by becoming nothing. Not one. Time Magazine, they put out a top 100 list a few years ago, the most significant individuals who ever lived. It was like their premier you know, publication all throughout history. And they use the same method Google uses for determining top website of any person, place, or thing. The, the most significant individual of all time above Napoleon, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, even above Aaron Rodgers, was <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth. They had a brutalized, tortured man hanging on a cross on the cover of their magazine. It makes no sense to the world. It makes total sense to us. Every other person on their list started out as nothing, as a nobody, and through great effort and strength and stepping on people to get to the top, they became great. Jesus alone started out as God, the greatest, and through making himself nothing, humbling himself, he revealed the truth of everything he taught his disciples while he is here on earth. Whoever wants to be the greatest shall be servant of all. Here, let me just you know, gird myself with a towel and wash your feet. You can't do that. Yes, I can. And I'll go lower if, if there was a lower place to go. You want to be first, you have to be last. You got to humble yourself as a little child. You have to die to live. And through his willing sacrifice, he has given to me and you the ability to choose to follow him. I don't have to. I can choose to follow him or not. For at the name of Jesus, as it says, every knee is going to bow. Those in heaven, those under the earth, those in the earth. He is the Lord. He's always been Lord of all. It's just that... Through his willing sacrifice, I have been extended a choice to willingly bow now. 
to bow before him as my Lord and to follow him as Lord by having the same mind. Yes, you want to show that you're bowing, have the same mind he has. Now show that I'm a follower of his. To say that all will bow doesn't mean that those who don't serve him now are going to stand before him and they're going to hold a gun to their head and say, you bow right now. It's just stating the fact that when they see Christ in his glory, they're going to be on their face before him. That's just the reality with or without, you know, his willing condescension and exultation. Everyone will serve him then, but if I don't willingly bow now to his humility, it'll be too late when I bow before his glory. Now, just as there were three steps to his condescension, the New Testament teaches there were also three steps just as significant to his exaltation. Turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. Gospel 24, verse 36. Now this, of course, is after his crucifixion, burial. And all the disciples, when he said these things, are gathered together. It says, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. They said to them, why are you troubled? And they said, well, duh. <laughs> Here you are. Why are your doubts rise in your heart? The gospel writers, you'll notice, they never make any attempts to explain these sudden appearances of Jesus. They don't try and say this is how this worked out. It's just like they were all talking there about him. Suddenly, there he was. Obviously, his presence couldn't be accounted for in any natural sense. Jesus stood in their midst, said, peace to you. And they were terrified and frightened, it says in verse 37. And they thought they were seeing a ghost. The dual verbs, terrified, frightened, are used to emphasize the magnitude of emotion. You know, we're used to seeing you know, cool special effects and 3D movie or something, but you have someone in real life, not on the big screen, someone unmistakably dead up here out of nowhere, I don't care who you are, this would freak you out. It's not some legend or ghost story. <laughs> this changed the course of human history forever. Everything went from B.C. to A.D., most of these disciples endured you know, the most violent persecutions and deaths because they could not deny what they saw. They were thrown into a state of shock. They said, what, why are you troubled? I mean, it's got to have a sense of humor or something. <laughs> why, why are your doubts rise in your heart? Behold my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, see, for spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. As you see, I have. Here the Lord seeks to convince his disciples of the reality of his resurrected body. That they're not, you're not looking at a ghost or an illusion. He does that by drawing their attention to his hands, his feet. Verse 39, which still bore the wounds from the crucifixion. He invites them, touch, touch me. I mean, amazing, man. To, and go ahead, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see, no mention of blood, that which is the life force of purely physical body. Evidently, there's a completely new life force in the glorified body. Verse 40 says, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still not, did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. There at his first appearance to his disciples, the wording's very specific 
the disciples reaction changed it says from a state of terrified unbelief in verse 37 to a state of joyful unbelief in verse 41 like all of a sudden it just changed to dude this is too good to be true <laughs> What is going on here? He's standing right with us. They marveled. They wondered at what was taking place. And his eating among them was meant to further alleviate their fears and their shock and misconception that they had just seen a ghost. Now, the Lord's resurrection is simply the first step, as I said, in his exaltation back to glory. It's the most important step. Because without a physical resurrection, if you're just like Jehovah Witness, oh, he resurrected in the spirit realm or something, it's crazy thing. Without a physical resurrection, 40 days like this, our faith and all that we believe as Christians would be theoretical. You'd be trying to prove a theory. You know, different than any other belief system or false religion, you know, where's the proof? Well, these guys had it, dude, and they spread it to everybody. We're told here in the New Testament, after 40 days of appearing just randomly to believers, we'll make sure everybody knew he, he rose physically from the dead and were able to go out and be witnesses to their death. Hundreds of them, hundreds of eyewitnesses, 1 Corinthians 15 says, the Lord then ascended back into heaven. Acts 1, if you turn right, Acts chapter 1. Like I said, there's, I don't know if there's a theological term, but the second step on his ascension or his, his ascension back to being exalted where he started from. First resurrection, then ascension. It says here, the former account I made, O Theophilus, all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall baptize with the Holy Spirit. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power, it says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Now, he doesn't say, you know, I'm going to send you a bunch of tracts and you got to go out witnessing for me. He says, <laughs> you just wait. I will give you the power. And if I need you to speak, I will put the words in your mouth. He says elsewhere. <laughs> right here, the Lord ministered to his disciples, presented himself alive after suffering. Verse 3, many infallible proofs seen by them 40 days upon giving them these final instructions regarding the power that would be given through the Holy Spirit so as to just go out and live your life filled with the Holy Spirit and you will be a witness for me. It says in verse 9, Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. This is describing a visible display once again. While they watched, it says, there's a different Greek verb used in verse 2 where it says that he was taken up. That speaks of this ascension into heaven generally. But here in verse 9, when it says he was taken up, it is literally he was elevated off the earth and a cloud received him from above. Luke is using very picturesque language to describe this amazing event that they saw. 
They saw him resurrected. They saw him eating. They saw his uh, hands and feet, all of that. And then they saw this. It's like the, the verb speaks of raising something up by getting under it and then a second force above catching the object and raising it up suddenly. Verse 10 says, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now the preposition is literally, and while they looked steadfastly into heaven. It's not, so this wasn't just a natural cloud. They were, they were seeing, it's not like Jesus just got smaller and smaller and smaller and just, there he goes, bye. You know? It's not like he just disappeared out into space. This is a supernatural cloud like the one that Israel followed around the wilderness that opened up, allowed the ability to some extent to see into heaven. Like when, he when Stephen was being stoned and it says, you know, I see the Lord. He's able to look into heaven and see the Lord standing there. The scene was so overwhelming that they didn't even notice two angels all of a sudden just standing with them who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The word gazing speaks of the look that someone has when they're lost in thought. You know, they're just like, hello, guys, you know, what are you doing? You Galileans, you know, snap out of it. This G same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so with that, Jesus had departed this earthly realm Upon doing so, a third step in his being highly exalted, Philippians 2 says, took place, which is referring to his exaltation back to glory at the right hand of the Father, back to the place in light of what we are reading in Philippians 2, back to a place of exercising full rights, full advantages of divine is a divine prerogative, divine attributes. So he exercises all divine attributes. So while he ascended into heaven from earth, he now fills all things, Ephesians 1 says. He is once again omnipresent as God. And so you get an idea of what this third final step, stage, whatever, consists of. Turn back a few pages of John 17. Amazing passage of scripture. I, I think Mike told me, Phil, you've been going through this for six months. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going letter by letter, yeah. <laughs> we don't go verse by verse, dude. We go letter by. <laughs> Are you kidding, man? It's awesome. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. The two things that verse 5 is affirming here, first of all, when it says before the world was, it's affirming the fact this material universe is not eternal. We know that. It's, it was called into existence by God. He spoke all this physical creation into being, Genesis chapter 1 says. But secondly, this verse also affirms the eternal pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ, once again existing in a state in which he shared in divine glory with the Father, existing in form as God, considering it not robbery to be equal with God. He's not praying to receive glory that comes through finishing 
the purposes for which he came into this world. He prays for a return to the glory that he had with the Father, the glory he shared with the Father. In other words, before this world came into existence, it is that divine glory that Christ shares with the Father and the Holy Spirit as one. It is that divine glory that he was willing to forego so as to fulfill the mission that resulted in our salvation, hallelujah, upon which, turn back to Philippians 2, being highly exalted, upon that, therefore God has highly exalted him back to that place at the right hand of the Father, given him the name which is above every name. Speaking of his exaltation back to the place he had with the Father before the world began, a place of exercising full use of all divine attributes that the Son shares with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. The Son, however, no longer holds that position of divine authority simply because he is God in his fundamental nature, but he holds that position of divine authority as Jesus with this name, the name above every name, that as verse 10 says, at that name every knee should bow, those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and every tongue should confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Through his infinite condescension to the cross, the opportunity has been provided to willingly bow to him now unto eternal salvation. Jesus, our divine, eternally exalted king, those who do bow to him are to have the same mind in us as was also in him, not following his example to be saved. I follow him and his example because I am saved. It's a total privilege as it is a privilege to share these things with you men tonight. And Father, thank you for your word. And God, by your Holy Spirit, I pray you would cause us to live according to your word. God, it's a daily battle to kill this flesh and to have that mind. I know it isn't me. Maybe these guys are perfect. <laughs> God. Thank you that you've given us the power by the Holy Spirit and, that, and the choice. Lord Jesus, you sit exalted. We worship you. We, we, we Lord, desire to be with you. And the day is coming. And when that day comes, Lord, what a joy it will be. What is our joy, Lord? What is our hope? What is our crown of rejoicing? It is not all these there in the presence of you, our Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, we praise you, we give you all glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. guys um, I wanted to enter into a little prayer tonight but Jeff and I didn't talk about what he was going to teach on and so he uh, taught us out of Philippians 2 and um, yeah, yeah I've been in John 17 for a while um, <laughs> but it's really teaching us the mind of Christ, because that's what he was really concerned about, is what he prayed to his father the night before he went to the cross. And really, it was all about his disciples. Um, and uh, last week, I think we talked about his humility. And uh, let me just preface what I'm about to say so I don't, you don't drift off, because I know it's getting late and you're tired. Um, everything in the Christian life boils down to humility. I am not overstating that. Everything you learn this weekend, everything you have learned throughout the course of your Christian life will never be placed into active, powerful, living through the Holy Spirit without humility. What is it? It's a two-dimensional thing. There's a, there is horizontal humility, 
uh, excuse me, vertical humility, which say, simply is our relationship to God, in that when we have horizontal humility, I'm sorry, vertical humility, uh, we basically have the mindset, I could do nothing apart from him. Everything I, I am, everything I, he wants me to do, all comes down to my humbling myself and saying, God, I can do nothing apart from you. That was earlier in the evening, John 15, I think, verse 5. Uh, you can do nothing apart from me. Humility before God is, Lord, I can do nothing. I am nothing. And, and anything you have asked of me or commanded of me, uh, how to live and anything, has to come through humility. I have to rely completely on you. Horizontal humility is the humility we show each other. Horizontal humility is manifested in the, in the thought of you are more important to me than I am. That's the humility that Jesus Christ demonstrated to all of us on the horizontal level. Now, oh, he's above us. I'm talking about when he became one of us. It's the very thing that Paul talked about, I think in Philippians 2, verse 5, verse, verse 3, um, esteeming others better than yourselves. Guys, I don't know what you've brought into this place this weekend. I don't know if you feel like your Christian life is on autopilot. There's no excitement. There's no power. I don't know if your marriage is in trouble. I don't know if whatever it might be, it all can be traced back to humility. I don't understand. I believe that's not overstating something. Be, if we're going to ever be what God wants us to be, we have to be humble before our God. And that's just all about, put it in a nutshell, dying to self. When I'm dead to self, God is everything. When I'm dead to self, you are everything to me. You're more important than I am. When you really walk in humility, and guys, it is a, it is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness. I checked on that one. That's the word humility. Uh, Self-control, right? These are all fruits of the Holy Spirit. But let's just focus on humility just for a second. We cannot manifest humility in our own strength. It's not like God is saying to us, now, look, work hard at being humble. It only comes as a fruit of our relationship with Christ. And the more we abide in him, the more the fruit of the Spirit grows through us. The fruit of the Spirit is really the nature of God. You realize that, right? Peter said, what, 2 Peter 1, 4, that when we accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit moved into our hearts and we became partakers of the divine nature. Now, the divine nature is love, joy, peace, long, so all these things, right? Now that God has moved into us through the Holy Spirit as believers, we have the, the capacity, we have the, the ability to manifest these things because they come from God and God's in us. But in our own strength, guys, no way. No way. And, and so I would like to go into just a time of prayer and I've asked God to show me what, what exactly, Lord, do you want us to take? We could come up here like we've done in the past and pray over each individually. Uh, we could have you stand and say, look, I need prayer for this. We, we'll if, if somebody really needs prayer for something, you can, we'll do that. Uh, but right now, let's bring our hearts before him and say, God, all the problems in my life are my fault. I'm not walking in humility. There are maybe in some areas I am. Other areas, maybe my marriage or how I deal with my kids or my walk in general. I need you Listen, I need you to crucify me. Do you realize that the Bible says that we are to crucify, right, our flesh? You can't crucify your flesh. You can't commit suicide through crucifixion. If God would have said, stick a knife in yourself to kill yourself or put a gun to your head, we could have done those things, but he knew the kind of death he was looking for was death from the Holy Spirit. Crucifixion is something somebody else has to do to you. And we have to understand that, that if we're going to be dead to self, 
And the more we are dead to self, the more we are alive to God. The less self has control, the more God will have control. And everything will just, the floodgates will open. We have to understand that, all right? So let's take just a minute while Zach kind of strums uh, on the guitar. Bow your heads. This is not between you and me or you and anybody else, but you and God. Bow your head. Confess to the Lord your pride, your selfishness, your obstinance, your stubbornness, and not wanting him to fully crucify you. And I will do the same before we kind of get into some prayer time. Father, we come before you as men who desire you. I mean, th these men would not be here this weekend if they didn't desire you. Lord, give us grace. Before you can work in us and through us, you have to enlighten us to who we are. Uh, we know we're sinners, Lord, but we gloss over that as if, okay, I acknowledge that, but we really don't take it to heart. We don't really ponder all the ways that that manifests itself in our lives. Father, please work within us. If we have learned any principles this week in that will benefit us, and, that, and every teaching has been incredible. Those teachings, those divine principles will fall on, well, they'll fall to the ground and die if they don't fall to the ground of our hearts where there is humility, where they can bear, uh, bear uh, uh, take root and bear fruit. Forgive us, Lord, for our pride. Forgive us for our selfishness. Forgive us, Lord, that we are not better husbands to our wives. We're selfish. We're prideful. We want to blame our wives for why we are not all that we should be. Forgive us, Lord, for being the fathers that, well, for not being the fathers we should be. Forgive us, Lord, for living in this world and thinking because we're not as dark as the world around us, we are light. That's not true. Jesus, you said that the Pharisees made a big mistake because they compared themselves with themselves to, to see if they were righteous but they're not the standard you are. Give us grace, Lord, to stand next to you each and every day to see how we are progressing. Because if we're not becoming more like you, we are not becoming more of what you want us to be. Father, these principles this weekend, burn them into our hearts. Make them living and powerful in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you would work in us, that we would stop making excuses for ourselves, that we would stop justifying our carnality and our compromises and our complacency. And I'm talking here to these men who are the ones that came out. <laughs> what about those that did not? These men have a heart to know you deeper. But Lord, help us. In these last days, we desperately need your spirit to crucify us, that we might be raised in the Spirit in that newness of life, that we might bear the fruit of the Spirit that only you can bear through us, that we might be truly lights in this dark world, that we would never be holier than thou or self-righteous, but that we would, Lord, in humility, correct those in opposition, out of love and concern, that, Lord, we would walk around not acting like who we are, but walking around putting others before ourselves. And Father, right now we'd like to open it up to anyone who would ask for prayer, might have a scripture to share, or even a word from your spirit. We want
want to open this time up. Lord, move among us. Move among us in a way we've never known before. Anybody has a prayer request or just has a prayer God's laid in your heart or a scripture, please speak it forward. Father, I know that there are men here tonight who are wrestling with pornography, maybe alcohol or drugs of some kind, or some other bondage in the flesh that the devil has used to enslave them. And they hate it. They're broken because of it. But it still has a grip on their lives. Father, we ask right now in Jesus' name, that your spirit would fall upon each and every man wrestling with some bondage. That, Lord, in Jesus' name, you would break the chains, smash the prisons, set the captives free. Fill us afresh with your spirit, that we might walk in that newness of spirit. For freedom, Christ has set us free, your word says, not to entangle ourselves again in a yoke of bondage. Father, we pray for liberty and forgive us for opening ourselves back up after you have redeemed us and freed us back to dabble in the same garbage it's like Israel wanting to go back to Egypt in the wilderness forgive us Lord the world has nothing to offer us we are children of the most high God give us a hunger for heaven's delights but Lord, set men free from whatever they are in bondage to. We ask it in Jesus' name. And Father, we just pray that you would Pour upon us a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we are in the last days. Your coming is near even at the door. Lord, we need a fresh infusion of power. That dynamic of the Spirit that will empower us, Lord, to be the light you want us to be. To have divine courage and boldness to go into a world of darkness that hates us, hates you. But, Lord, that we would confront them in love because they've been taken captive by the devil to do his will. They are not our enemies. Lord, <laughs> Washington, D.C. is not the enemy. Hollywood is not the enemy. The liquor industry, the gaming industry, they're not the enemies. The porn industry, they have been taken captive by the devil to do his will. We pray for their souls. Give us grace, Lord. Give us that fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit power to be what we can't be in the flesh. To live for you in these last days as lights. So we thank you, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name.